Hello, and welcome to the special presentation broadcast live from the studios of PAC TV, Plymouth Area Community Television, in southeastern Massachusetts. I am Dori Stoley, Program Manager for the Goldenrod Foundation, which has organized today's event as part of a winter speaker series, Making Waves in Coastal Conservation. Please join us again on February 20th for On the Wing, a celebration of birds in music, poetry, and science, and on March 16th to hear The Adventures of a Coastal Naturalist. Our presenter tonight is Lindsay Hurt, a Plymouth-based marine scientist and educator. Lindsay holds a bachelor's degree in marine biology and a master's degree in emergency management and works as a consultant in marine conservation issues. She's an active volunteer for local education and conservation programs, such as Goldenrod's own Beach Ambassadors Volunteer Corps, putting her beliefs, which are based on science and compassion, into action. Now, on to our presentation, Whales in Your Backyard, how learning the secrets of the great whales helps us to protect them and our oceans. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Lindsay Hurt, your friendly marine biologist, neighborhood marine biologist. I'm broadcasting to you tonight live from the studios of PAC TV in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And tonight we're going to be talking about the whales that live in our backyard here in Massachusetts and how we apply some of the research that we use for these whales in particular to protect other whales here and all around the world. So um, let's take a look at the backyard that we're talking about before we get started on the whales. As you can see by this map here, provided to us by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, this is the entire coastline of the state of Massachusetts. We are in the western North Atlantic Ocean, and as you can see, we're completely surrounded by water, which is great because it's an incomparable living laboratory to help us with our studies. It's also a great place to recreate as there are beaches everywhere. What I want to show you here of a place of special interest is Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And that is a big giant square just north of the arm that sticks out from Cape Cod. And that's a really special place because it's biologically very productive. What that means is that there's a lot of food that grows in the area. Stellwagen Bank is a sandy plateau that was left by the last um, sheet of ice that deposited a whole bunch of sand there and left it to be a really, really shallow spot where a process called upwelling brings up cold, nutrient-filled water to the surface. And that gives us the basis of the food that we have here to provide for the whales that come to visit us. The red star on the screen is depicting where Plymouth is. That's where we're broadcasting to you from tonight. And um, Plymouth, I just want to say, is the quintessential New England town. It's a place where there's art and culture and history. And I would say of all the towns in Plymouth, in uh, Massachusetts rather, um, I would call it really symbolic. It's America's hometown because it's really well known for the pilgrims who landed here in 1620. They colonized here, why? Because of the rich natural resources, in part because of the marine mammals, the live birthing, air breathing, warm blooded whales that we're going to be talking about tonight. So let's look at two examples. We're going to start with the gregarious cosmopolitan species known as the humpback whale. As you can see by this photograph, they are completely acrobatic and flexible, twisty, and beautiful. Um, they're characterized by a knobbly head and really long pectoral fins that stick out from their chest. The word Megaptera novangliae is the Latin name for humpback whale, and it means the big-winged New Englander. That is, they come to visit us every year in, in uh, New England, around Massachusetts, of course, and because of their long pectoral fins, which can be up to a third of the size of the body. What I want to say about the humpback whale is that they, there were fewer of them prior to the protections that are in place now. The International Whaling Commission puts about 150,000 of these as an estimate worldwide. Here in New England, around Stellwagen Bank and Cape Cod Bay, we have about 12,000 of them, which we're trying to keep track of. And without these protections, those numbers might be in the hundreds. Let's take a look at another animal. This is the very alien looking <laughs> creature called the North Atlantic right whale. This is um, a shot provided to us by New England Aquarium from the sky, which is a 
great way to see them. I want to point out here that there are two whales in this picture, a mom and a calf, and they're swimming in the right direction, right whales swimming in the right direction. It's so hard to tell what they look like because they have such a strange build, and we're going to take a closer look and talk a little bit more about why they're so threatened. Eubilana glacialis is the Latin term for North Atlantic right whale, and that means true or good whale of the ice. And what that refers to is that they prefer cooler waters where they come to feed. So as far as right whales are concerned, there are some in our waters that visit us each year. They do prefer the winter months here, as opposed to the humpback whales that like to visit us more in the summertime. And they're not quite doing it as hot as the humpbacks are. Prior to protections that were placed on them in the 14, 15, 1600s in whaling era, there may have been as many as 10,000 of these animals, but right now they've dipped as low as approximately 500. So they're in a critically endangered state. Let's take a look at some of the risks. So let me reach out to you guys and ask, why do you think the great whales are at risk? No cheating, no looking it up on your phone. What would you guess would be the reason why an animal the size of a school bus or larger might have a problem getting around in the ocean? I'll take any suggestion. What do you think, guys? Maybe they take like, longer to mature. They do take longer to mature. That's a really good point. And we did learn that through research. Yes? Anybody else? They're at the surface, so they might be more prone to um, human efforts um, without malice, but sometimes they're going to get hurt. Absolutely. The reason why they are at such risk is because not only do they have to deal with their own issues of survival, but they have to deal with all the things that humans impact on them. So in this particular picture, on the left side, you'll see the humpback whale outline. And on the right, you'll see a right whale outline. You can get a sense of what the bodies look like. They breathe air, right? So they have to come up to the surface of the water where a lot of humans hang out. So there's an abundance of materials and issues that can occur there that might bother them, like fishing gear, or in this case, boats. If you take a really close look at each of these pictures, the humpback on the left and the right whale on the right, you'll see that there are very large propeller marks in each of these animals. And that's because when they came to the surface, they interacted with a boat, and it didn't go so well for them. Tell me in this next photo, what adjective do you think of? What, what does this bring to mind to you, this picture? What does it make you think of? You guys don't look very happy when you look at this. You're like super depressed. Do you think this whale's going through a good time right now? No. It kind of, most of the time I can say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? In this case, not so much. This is another risk for the whales that we see. What you see here is a right whale. The mouth is more towards the bottom and the back of the animal. We only see the head right now, but the back of the animal is towards the, the top of the screen. And what you're looking at is a fishing line entangled all inside that whale's mouth. Because when the whales eat their food, they do it close to the surface oftentimes, and they can get entangled in the, some of those ropes. It can have very heavy drag and impede them from being able to eat. And so this is a welfare issue for this animal, not only for one animal, but if one or two die and there's very few in the population, it's going to have an even greater impact. So these are things to think about. Any human impact that you might think of, trash, boats, fishing vessels, fishing gear, pollution, noise, all of these things have an impact on whales, just like they can have an impact on us. Let's keep going. So. Has anyone ever heard of the term urban whale? What do you think that means? It's very cultured whale, likes theater, good restaurants. <laughs> Absolutely, good restaurants. We know that they have a very defined palate, right? <laughs> well, not so much. I wish that were the case. The term urban whale refers to specifically the right whale, but can often be thought of, of any of the great whales, um, is that they hang out really close to shore. The map that you see to here provided by NOAA is showing us the migration 
of the animal as it moves from breeding to feeding grounds. Now, the majority of the great whales, when they are going through their life period, their yearly pattern is that they tend to spend more time feeding in, in the cooler, temperate, uh, I'm sorry, the cooler, more polar atmosphere. And so they'll want to be in the north up here. And that, that's a great place for them to hang out if they want to eat food because the food they like is an oxygen-rich, rich, fish-filled water. That's a great place for them. And that's why they come to us. If they're in the process of breeding, you know, doing adult whaley things, they like to go to the warmer climate for vacation as we do here <laughs> as well. Um, and so that's what you're looking at. But what do you notice about this, the track in the map here on the uh, coast of the United States? Is it way sticking out way far into the water or is it really close? Pretty much hugs the shore, right? So these animals are within 20, 30, 40 nautical miles from the shore oftentimes, and what else is so close to the shore? Do you take your fishing trips 500 miles from home? Not usually, so what else is out there? Fishermen, recreational boats, recreational boats cruise liners, shipping vessels going in and out of ports. That's a lot of traffic. You're basically playing frogger with your life. So. The inset picture is of a humpback whale off the coast of New York. I just want to point out how close those buildings are. You can actually whale watch from your office over there sometimes. So that's a pretty interesting one and given to us by Gotham Whale. That picture was only taken just a few weeks ago. So you tell me, who has the right of way? Is it humans or whales? whales. Some of you say whales and some of you say humans. What do you think? Whales. Yes. whales. Why whales and not humans? Because it's their water. It is their water, and they were probably here before us, maybe. So if you think about it that way, absolutely. But tell me this, what business do we have in the ocean? Food. Food. Awesome. Number one, 3.5 billion people in this world depend on this ocean for food. It takes up three quarters of the planet, right? In 20 years, that number might double to 7 billion. So fishing, food, it's a resource, absolutely. Think about the other things. When you get Game Boy, it oftentimes comes over from a ship from China, right? So shipping, industry. How about oil and gas? How about recreation? Oh, and there's this other one, whale watching. Whale watching at this moment in time is approximately a $2 billion a year, year industry. So that's something to think about too. So we kind of have to make sure we can put good regulations and protections in for whales, but that also consider humans. So let's do a little more of that considering. Well, see, we discussed some of the risks, right? Now we have to think about how to put those risks into play. Way back into the 70s when we started developing the green movement, we put into play some laws. Has anyone ever heard of the Marine Mammal Protection Act? Probably, right? Yeah, it gets out there once in a while. But it's not something you think about every day, right? It's not at the top of your head. You don't know exactly what's defined by that. Well, in gen general terms, the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 provides protections for animals that live in the ocean that happen to be mammals. So that includes whales, of course, dolphins, porpoises, seals, polar bears, walruses. Great. We have some things outlined there. There was an additional law, the Endangered Species Act. You've heard of that, right? Okay, good. <laughs> Following a year later, and that coned in some of the, the issues that we were looking at for whales, and maybe a little bit more dealt with the human impacts so we can really specify the laws. The only thing about laws like this is that times change, right? We were talking about food before and how we depend on that more and more. Well, is the human population getting smaller or is it getting bigger? Bigger. bigger. By a little or by a lot? Oh, way a lot, okay? So when you're thinking about vessels on the water, we have to start dealing with maybe changing some of those laws, augmenting them, making them more efficient and appropriate for what we're trying to do here. And, you know, I don't know if a law is enough. What else do you think you need to do with a law in order to make it work? Act upon, Act upon of course. Enforcement. Enforcement. Big one. Excellent. It takes a lot of money, a lot of manpower, and a lot of time to do that. So if nobody really knows what those laws mean, like they're sort of ephemeral in your head right now, but they don't really mean a whole lot, right? You need to have awareness. And so there is a lack of awareness. And so part of what we're doing here is also educating, which is why I'm here for you today. Let's delve deeper. So when we think about 
putting some more efficiency and changing laws and adding protections for things like whales, what are we doing? We're collecting data. data through research, right? So the reason why I brought you guys here today is to tell you about some of those new, cool technological features. Actually, I totally tricked you because that's only a really small portion of what we're doing. I'm going to go over the low-tech stuff first. Tricked you. <laughs> so let's take a look back to, you remember we talked about two different kinds of animals earlier, the humpback whale and the right whale. We're going to go through each of these. I promise you it's going to be fun. Okay? What do you see in this picture? A humpback. Absolutely. What part of the body is it? Head or butt? The fluke. It's the fluke. The fluke. Excellent. The fluke is the tail. The great thing about humpback whales is they're known to be a humpback whale because of the way they dive. Check out this dive sequence provided to me by my friends from Whale and Dolphin Conservation in Plymouth. This is like a film reel. Now if you look at the top, what you see is the whale's back with the dorsal fin sticking out. And as it moves to take a deeper dive into the water, you can see that there's a big curve in that back end. That's the tail stalk where all the muscles holding up that big giant tail. In the third reel, you can see the tail starting to lift out of the water and all that water is starting to drip off of it. And in the final shot, boom, big huge tail butt sticking out of the water. It provides us a great way to take a good photograph of an animal to get an identification on them. How do you think we get that ID? Hmm? Well, yeah, oftentimes it is a boat. You do have to be able to look at the animal to know it's kind of hard to do it from land because it, there are small details in there. But if you really zoom in, what do you notice about the ta uh, tail on the right versus the tail on the left here? They're two different animals. And the colors are different? The colors are different. And that's because on every butt of every humpback whale is a different pattern akin to a thumbprint on a human being or any fingerprint, right? So they each have their own individual identification. That's only for the humpback whale, mind you. So that's one way that we've been able to identify what they look like. The big picture here, um, the whale tail on the right, is a whale named Ventisca. She's one of my very favorites. Her name in Spanish means blizzard. Why do you think that is? Why, take a look at her tail. It's all speckly with snow, right? <laughs> very pretty. So let's put this into action. I want you guys to now, you have the concept of fluke matching and knowing that an individual okay, has a particular pattern, we'll say, on their back end, their fluke. So all I want you to do is throw out a number. Tell me, tell me now how many whales do you think you see in this picture? Just throw out a guess, anyone. Four, that's a good guess. Anybody else? Three. Three. Anyone else? Five. Five. Are you just saying Did numbers? You, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> How many people think there are seven animals here? Seven separate animals? I, it's hard to tell, but it looks like there actually could be seven separate animals. There, there could be. Yeah. Well, let's see if you guys are right. We'll ask the online audience, too, what they think. So oh, we're, we did some oh, color matching here. Right. Nice. <laughs> I'll put the two out there. I'll see which one. So there's four, OK? The colors match the doubles. Red, there's two whales. That's a very famous whale that comes to Cape Cod every year, Cajun. The green is another double of the same whale named Pepper. The yellow is another double of, of a whale named Osprey, and that one always gives me trouble. You can see how fuzzy it can be. And the really, really white fluke with the purple border, that's the only one that doesn't have a matching double. That's a whale named Wizard. So you only had four whales, whales here to have to match. Imagine 12,000. <laughs> In the Gulf of Maine, we have a catalog. It's um, worked on by many different organizations, including the Whale and Dolphin Conservation and the Center for Coastal Studies and Allied Whale all the way up in Maine. All, so many people contribute data in it. There are over 4,000 whales in that, and that's still only approximately a third of the whales that we have here. So is this an easy process? Hmm, not so much. Let's take a look at this process for right whales and see if it's easier or harder. Right whale photo ID. Can you get it from the tail? Not so easy. Sometimes they do dive and stick their butt out of the water, but guess what? Not an easy thumbprint. So instead, we have a different method. Roger Payne in the 1970s was able to discover that whales like right whales have a particular ink blot type of look on their face. They have these little tiny things called 
callosities. They're just a dermal patch, kind of like a rough elbow patch. And they're sort of just a dry bit of skin. And every whale has them on top of their head. That is a right whale, of course. And those are filled with tiny little marine parasites. They're basically a skeleton shrimp, and they're called cyamid. And what a cyamid is is just a little parasite that likes to scratch off and eat the dead skin on top of a whale's face. And when they sit inside the whale over time, those little dermal callosities, they become white. And it gives us a beautiful pattern that we can see, but it's very hard to see from the water. So what we'll often do is do aerial surveys by plane, look down and take pictures of the whales, and that's the best way to tell. How easy do you think it is to match an animal like this? <sighs> you bet. I definitely can't do it, and I've been looking at whales for at least 12 years now. So there is a catalog for this as well. For the North Atlantic right whales, there is a catalog maintained by the New England Aquarium. It has over 5 million records of whales in it. It's been cataloged and there's been surveys done since 1978. That's a lot of data, a lot of data. By comparison, in the South, in South America, there are right whales there as well. There are different subspecies of right whale, but the Ocean Alliance in Gloucester, Massachusetts has been following those whales for about 40 years now, and they have logged, I believe, 2,600 southern right whales only by the callosities on their face. Isn't that amazing? It's pretty cool. So they don't change as the callosities, as, uh, it just seems like that's not a fixed thing, that it would change over time. It doesn't change a whole lot. Another way to be able to help to tell who the individuals are is what kind of scars they have over time. So that's an additional way to be able to get a sense. If you ever watch something like CSI Miami, maybe when they identify someone who's been burned in a fire, it could be by their teeth, the work done in their teeth, or by a tattoo on their body. That's something that might change over time as opposed to the look on the face. Let's continue. So we did the low-tech stuff, that low-tech stuff that was actually kind of hard. Let's get to the bigger things. Here we have aerial drones. These are really, really cool. This is cutting edge work. Has anyone here ever seen a drone? You have? Okay, so it's kind of like doing a robotic helicopter or something like that. Well, oftentimes what's being used right now is a hexacopter where there's multiple pieces that come out and cameras that are attached to them. Now this has been a really useful research tool only very recently for NOAA, that's our government agency that goes out and looks at animals like this, in order to take data from the sky. Now the reason why we like to do this is because it's less invasive than dragging a boat right up to an animal, scaring them away or possibly hitting them with propellers just to get a little bit of data. If you use a drone and you can manually operate it from further away, it costs a lot less money and it doesn't put the whales in as much risk just to get your data. Now that, that's been hugely successful in the Pacific Northwest to get a photo like this, as you can see from NOAA and the Vancouver Aquarium. This photo is from the sky and it's over 100 feet away, but it's getting excellent, excellent visibility to view a pod of orcas together. And one of the things that they can look at is, what are the whales out there eating? Is anybody pregnant? How many are together? As you can see, just by being able to video or take photos of these animals from a little closer and in a safe manner, you get a lot more information. The inset photograph is again from Ocean Alliance. I know I mentioned them a short time ago. They have actually worked with a group of students, engineering students, in a robotics lab at Olin University and have engineered their own drone that they've affectionately named Snotbot. And the reason why they've named it Snotbot is because they're trying to find a way to collect mucus from the blows that whales make in the air when they breathe. So they're currently in the process of getting a permit from that. It's a really cool idea, and I, I hope it goes through, but that's just one way that it's being applied. Now, with the drones that we see here, I do have a disclaimer that goes with them. They're an excellent research tool when you know how to apply them and use the laws and be careful about the whale behavior. But some people try to use them for personal use, and it is neat to be able to play with toys, but I wouldn't suggest doing that around a 50-foot-long, 45-ton animal. You might harass the whale, and you might hurt yourself, and you're probably going to ruin your own equipment, too. So I just want to slide that in there, that it's still sort of a controversial subject as it comes to personal use. Let's take a look at another piece of really cool technology. The autonomous gliders. What does that look like to you? Submarine or a missile? A missile. Yeah. 
They look a little scary, but they're actually not. They're a fantastic tool that has just been developed within the last 10 years. It does look a lot like a missile. The autonomous glider works underwater and, as its name suggests, does it by itself. It's deployed from a boat, as you can see from the inset photo. And what they do is they move towards areas where whales are and they collect information with a whole suite of sensors on them and they can pick up a lot of acoustic data. So it's a really useful tool to use. The, um, the government has spent some time collaborating with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and have worked very hard to engineer this and it's doing a really great job because it's getting into places where regular forms of data collection and research might not be so easy, like vessel surveys or at an off season when there aren't a lot of people to help or you know, if you run out of gas or something like that, you can still deploy this and get some really good information. Let's uh, see another one. D-tags, has anyone ever heard of these before? They're really, really famous on Cape Cod. They were developed here. Anyone know about these? D-tags, it means digital acoustic recording tag. And this is my very favorite because look at how it's applied. Can you see what's happening in this picture here? The photograph is being taken from a very small Zodiac boat. I will put a disclaimer in and say it is dangerous work. You have to be highly trained to do it. But it's really neat because it's just a little tiny, almost looks like a battery pack, as you can see in the subset photograph. And what we're looking at is a team of experts who know how to move around these animals carefully. There's a long, long pole with suction cups attached to this little tiny sensor that goes in this long whale. And they just suck right on, take their information, and they can be deployed, left alone to collect any information, and then they pop off floating free, away from the whale, and easily collected without putting the animal in any danger whatsoever. It's a really useful tool because it collects great information on individual whales. In particular, we've been able to see this tool used for humpback whales in Stellwagen Bank, and we've been able to record dive data to see how the whale moves in a 3D manner in the water. We've actually learned how the whales do their dance when they're collecting food off of Cape Cod, and that's really interesting stuff. Let's move on to our last high-tech piece of equipment. Passive acoustic monitoring. So this is different than moving around with some kind of a sensor like a hydrophone on a boat and having to be in an area in order to collect information. Passive acoustic monitor is something that just sits in a spot on a buoy and waits until it hears something. And when it gets some sound, it collects the sound and it bounces it to a lab, and the lab listens and says, oh, is that a right whale? <laughs> well, in this case, it is. The picture on the left is sort of just a graphic to get a sense of it picking up a sound. And on the right, you see a spectrogram. This is from the Cornell Bioacoustics Laboratory, and what it's showing you is just a visual of what the sound of a whale call looks like. In this case, it's a right whale's up call. Sounds a little bit like whoop. And you'll see on the axes here, on the vertical axis, that's the frequency. And on the horizontal axis, that's the time. The parts that are darker are where the sound is louder. So can you kind of see the curve as it swoops up? So it's sort of like a swoop, uh, you know, a swoop or a, an up call. And that's a great way to record some information. We talked about other methods previously, how to get information from the whales. But this is a great one where we can develop a whole suite of of a library, rather, I guess, of, of right whale calls. And that's actually used here in uh, Stellwagen Bank and um, Cape Cod Bay area to detect the most endangered species and be able to tell boats who are in the area that whales are close by. And in it, that is allowing them to do things like slow down and have a sense of where the whales are so they know what to look for. It's really helpful stuff. If you ever get a chance, go to listenforwhales.org and you can hear them for yourself instead of hearing me sing badly. <laughs> Let's take a look at the next. Now, we talked about the high-tech stuff. The next step is how do we apply it? So knowledge, as you guys in high school know, is power, right? Right, you guys from high school? Yeah, you absolutely know that. <laughs> or you will after you graduate anyway, right? What do all of these 40 years of right whale identifications and density maps and food web distributions and you know, ship calls tell us? What does that tell us? Well, here's a fantastic application right here. 
What you're looking at on the screen is a very complicated looking map that boils down to a very simple idea. It's called a TSS, or Traffic Separation Scheme. And all this is, is a very simple lane shift. The vessels go into Boston Harbor, that's on the left side there, that little circle of water there. And they are, this is above Cape Cod Bay, by the way, I don't think I said that, but you're crossing Stellwagen Bank and going into Boston Harbor, as you can guess, it's probably a very busy area where there are a lot of vessels that go in and out. And they have to identify a shipping lane with which to work through. So the solid line is the old shipping area. As you can see, with all the little dots in there and the warm, heated tones, that's an area where we have depicted spots where whales are very high density. They like to hang out there in groups. This is a little bit of a problem because whales and boats, they don't really mix very well together. So over time, we've been able to accumulate enough data to map out where the whales tend to like to go. And we said, OK, we can move just a little bit where we go instead. Right? So that's what we did here. We shifted the, the lanes. Uh, this was in the early 2000s to where the dotted lines are now. And you see how it really reduced the risk for the whales? A very simple thing to do after years and years of data, and that really helped. This framework has been such a good, useful tool that it's been actually applied in other parts of the world. We're starting to see places really develop tools and put them on maps like this to really just change the risk level. Recently, in December 2013, Santa Barbara off the coast of California took the same idea and they shifted and they have a serious reduction in interactions between whales and boats. So it's a very useful tool. Let's move on and check out other stuff. Whale watching guidelines. Anyone ever go on a boat and see this posted there? Guidelines are not law. They're just guidelines. But after spending all kinds of time on boats and in vessels and with technology and learning about Hmm, what do whales like to do? The humpback whales in particular, we've been able to learn a lot about their behavior. And so we can put that onto a map and say, what do we do and how do we operate safely around them? This is a great way to suggest to people who spend a lot of time in the ocean how to take care of their boat and to make sure that their interactions are very safe around whales. For example, you can see as the whale is oriented up and the head is towards the top, there's a no head on approach. Why do you think that is? You don't want to make your boat cross right in front of the head of a whale. Why would you want to avoid doing that? The neck is probably the most vulnerable part. Yeah, neck and face is very vulnerable. And let's see, if you're driving on a road and a car comes straight toward you, what is your, what's your inclination? What do you swerve want to do? Yeah, you want to swerve out of the way. So one form of harassment is to change the behavior of a whale. Or, my God, you might hit them too, right? So that really reduces your risk of that. As you get closer, the idea is you want to just slow down and then stop and then not cross in front of whales. Very useful and pretty logical idea. So there's another really wonderful way that we can apply some of the information we learn about these whales. Once again, my friends from Whale and Dolphin Conservation have provided me with some excellent information here. This is a beautiful graph. And you know what it is? What does it look like to you? Instead of faces there. Their tails. Family tree. It's a family tree. <laughs> it's really, really wonderful. This is Salt's family tree. Salt is the grand dame of Stellwagen Bank. She's the most famous of all the humpback whales and probably one of the most photographed. She was discovered back in the late 70s and was the first humpback whale to be named. Since then, she's been tracked. She has come back to this area every single year except for once. It was a very scary year for some of us when we thought she might not return, but she did. She returned this year with her most recent calf, who was affectionately named Epsom, yeah, Epsom Salt. It's like pretty cute, right? <laughs> and in the same year, her granddaughter also had a baby. So isn't that cute and endearing? She had a baby and a great grandbaby at once. And so for the first year ever, we're able to see a map that shows four generations with one whale family. Matriarchal, of course. Usually the boys say, I'm going to mate with you, and then I'm going to take off. I don't really have any duties here. But we can learn a lot about the whales this way. So that's just another nice way of doing it. One other wonderful application that we've been able to use after learning so much about whales over time is phone apps. You guys probably have your hands on your phone right now, right? You don't go five minutes without looking at it? Well, if you want to do something cool and useful and conservation-y, then try Whale Alert. Whale Alert right now is just for iPhones, 
but it's been improving over the last few years. It's a collaboration between multiple organizations like the U.S. Coast Guard and the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And what they do is they put together a whole bunch of tools to let mariners know that they need to slow down when there are whales in the area. First, it was just for right whales. As you can see, this picture, and I'm sorry that it's fuzzy, but it's just taken from a cell phone because that's how easy it is to use, shows Cape Cod. And above it, the passive acoustic monitoring we were talking about, well, that gave us a great system of buoys we call the right whale listening network. And the right whale listening network, it tells us when there's whales around. And when the whales are around, we can hear them. And when we can hear them, we can say, hey guys, guess what? If you're on the water, be careful. So what you're seeing here is the green circles show that there has not been any up calls or any calls at all from a right whale detected in 24 hours. If it turns red, it means that in, in the last 24 hours, a sound has been heard and whales are close. So for each monitor, each buoy, they can hear the sound of a whale up to five miles away. It's pretty amazing stuff. That used to be the original application for whale alert, but now the scope and the impact is even bigger. We have more than just Cape Cod in the Gulf of Maine, and it's all very easily used. You can find out anything you want about whales in it, all of the great whales. All they use is GPS in the AIS system. That's the automatic identification system, which all boats have, and you can use it right when you're on the boat. If you're in Nebraska, you can use it too. I like to look at whale pictures any time of day, but it's very useful stuff. Okay, so last question before we get to your questions, okay? Why do we care about whales? These are my reasons, and I'm sorry for all of the words on the page, but why do you care about whales? They're my spirit animal. They're your spirit animal? Yeah. Oh, that's really sweet. They're mine too. <laughs> but why else? We talked about some of the threats, right? So some of the threats might include entanglement, vessel strike. How about trash, right? For each individual animal, trash or any of those threats is a welfare issue out of pain and suffering. The reason why I put this very odd looking photograph here provided to me by the Virginia Aquarium is that in August 2014, a beautiful federally endangered say whale washed up on a river in Virginia, totally out of place, almost completely starved to death, and with cracks in the vertebrae and bruises on the head. After the necropsy, or the animal autopsy, was done, one piece of trash was pulled out of its stomach. Does anyone know what that is? It's a shard of sharp plastic. It was identified, and if, you'll know it when you see it, as a portion of a DVD case. Can you see it? This story's actually been being passed around all over the place. Ever since I heard about it at a consortium I went to in November, I've been burning to tell people about it. And it's, it's just coming out now all over the internet. This is a DVD case that someone was careless with. Who knows how it got into the ocean? But it's assumed that the whale, when he, or she actually, was eating on the surface, a 45-pound animal somehow swallowed this and it got inside the stomach and really shredded things up in there, made it a little bit more difficult for it to eat, caused some infection. When the whale washed ashore, do you think it had had a nice time between swallowing this and the time it washed ashore? You've got to miss a lot of food to starve to death if you're 45 feet long, am I right? So think about this, a piece of plastic a few inches long. There's more that we can do, and there's a lot that they go through because of the simple choices that we make. So that's one thing, that's why I care about whales. I don't want them to suffer. There are a few other things too. The conservation of the species. For New England, I talked about Plymouth as being the quintessential area, the America's hometown, where we, we really love our history here. We love to talk about why we came here and what's ahead of us and to remember our past. Well, one of the parts of our past is the, the whales. They're a natural resource for us. They were then years ago when they were precious to us for their whalebone, for their meat, for their oil. Now they're precious to us because they're another natural resource. We use them for whale watching. A lot of people have jobs on the coast because of whales. So that's something to consider too. The third and the final thing is that more than all of these things, even if the whales didn't exist, okay, if you take them out of the system, they're balanced for the ocean. And there's two major reasons for that. I'm only going to just briefly touch on them. But I want to talk really quickly about the whale pump, or as I like to call it, the whale dump. See, whales are so large, they eat so much food that they actually contribute greatly to the balance of the system. Because every time they eat, they also have to 
poop, <laughs> just like you, right? And because they're air-breathing mammals and they also dive deep to get food and to do all the different things, they're going through all the different portions of the water column and they migrate long, long ways. So every time they eliminate from their body, they're redistributing nutrients that are feeding the plankton that make the oxygen that you breathe. So that's a really big consideration. There's lots of work coming out on that right now. The other thing I want to mention is whale fall. And what that means is that a whale, when they die, just like every organism eventually does, will float to the bottom if it doesn't drift ashore. And it's such a massive being that they actually are a small ecosystem in themselves, feeding all sorts of different organisms that then contribute to the, the ecosystem. So these are just things to think about why we care about whales. I care about each one, but I care about the preservation of them as a whole as well, because Seven out of the 13 great whale species right now are either endangered or threatened in some way, and that's after multiple protections on them. So those are things to be considered. So what's next? Well, we talked about all of the great technology. We're going to continue to re-examine the laws. We're going to continue to hone the technology, and we're going to continue to make our understanding of them better. But we can't really do any of that unless we have some help. Who do you think I'm going to ask for, for that? <laughs> exactly. Remember we talked about manpower and expense? Yeah, you're all free workers. <laughs> Whales need you. Your conscious choices. Remember the DVD story. It's not the only one. There are whales and all kinds of other animals that wash up on the, the beach. They're choked with plastic. Their stomach is full of trash, right? Your conscious choices, what you do every day, every little thing, whether you use straws or not, whether you remember to recycle your cans or not, whether you turn on the water and let it run forever and ever, or use extra electricity. These are all conscious choices that you can make. And every one of them contributes to what we're doing with the whales. Because it contributes to the natural balance of the ecosystem, right? Save the planet! <laughs> I want you to save the planet. But more than that, Citizen science is becoming more of a thing, and if you want to be part of the trend, get in on it. Get on Whale Alert. Send us your information. If you are fishing, hey, you see somebody struggling out there, some poor whale, call a hotline. I've provided you one here for our regional area, but I would like to tell you that you can find them anywhere. You can live in Indonesia. There are hotlines there that you can call to keep people in touch with that. So just be thinking about that. Be responsible with how you use your boat with how you manage your life, with what you do with your resources. Be stewards for the environment. But also, don't be afraid to talk, because every piece of data is very, very important. OK? So with that, I'd like to go to questions from the audience. I'm going to take a few from you guys, and then I'd like to hear from the online community. We also have um, a couple of Twitter handles here. Mine is at OceanDevotion84. You can put a question there. And for Goldenrod Foundation, it's GoldenrodFN. We're using the hashtag tonight, Making Waves, because this is making waves in coastal conservation. So, guys, what do you think about what you learned tonight? Do you have any ideas, any things that you want to say, a question, a comment, something you want to elaborate on? Who has anything? Or did we cover it all? <laughs> well, I just want to know, like, isn't it really hard to know what what whale it is if you identify it by its tail and each one really similar they can be and that's actually that's a really good point because i just showed you a few right you can see the more whales you have whether they're a humpback whale or a right whale or any of the other whales that we didn't even discuss there's a system for that so over time the organizations who research these animals and study them maybe their eyeballs cross a little bit but they do have catalogs so for the humpback whale, for example, we talked about, you can see on the fluke, the tail, um, there's a pattern there. Those patterns can range from very, very white, as you saw in the photos in our little game, to extremely dark. And so there's a system rating them from one to five on their color. So we can sort of line them up that way, kind of like you alphabetize your CD, your CD collection if you're sort of an organizational nut like I am, <laughs> or color code your closet. And that's one way to help. There are actually online databases, too, and even whole Facebook groups that are starting to look at things like that. So that's one way to tell. Um, I don't think that you should just try to memorize every whale. 
because that's never going to happen, especially those poor guys at Ocean Alliance down in South America trying to look at 2,600 whale faces. It's not very easy, but it can be done. Yeah, that's what catalogs are for. Good question. Anything else? Anybody want to ask about technology or whale ID? Or if you want another trashy story, I can give you about 50. Yes? Um, do they tag whales at all? They do tag whales. So remember that piece of technology I talked about, the D-tag? That's one form of tagging that's a short-term tag because it just suctions onto the whale. The whale doesn't really even feel it. They might be kind of annoyed. Oh, God, a boat's coming up to me. What do I do? They don't feel anything at all when that D-tag is on there, but can be on from a matter of hours to a couple of days. To Some tags can be on for even a few weeks. But they just collect the information that they need to collect, and they're usually gone. Um, a D-tag isn't the only way to do it. If you've ever uh, been involved in an organization like International Fund for Animal Welfare, they will release dolphins back into the wild that strand ashore, and they put something that looks like a cow tag on them. Have you seen that? It's like a, in the ear. You know, it's like it looks like a piece of plastic. That's something that can stay on for longer, and eventually that will wear away. But those will have numbers on them, and maybe sometimes they're color coded. So we can identify animals that way as well. They're lower tech, so we don't get as much information on them. But there are many, many ways to tag an animal. Some are really invasive, and some are not so bothersome, like the suction cup D-tag. So yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, are whales considered a foundation species and a keystone species, or more just keystone species? What do you mean by foundation species? Um, like, do they help? Do they help build up any as like any specific ecosystem, or are they more more of just like an important part of it? Yes, I would say yes, yes, yes to all of that. Okay. Of course, whales to me are they're my passion. So I think of them as um, you know very interesting, very uh, ethereal, very um, uh, anthropomorphized. What I mean by that is. I kind of humanize them because I give them names and I think they're cute and cuddly, but I also know they're a really important puzzle piece to what we call our ecosystem, what we call our food web. And on top of that, they're a sentinel species because they, they're something that can give us an indication of how the rest of the environment is doing. For the right whales, for example, they are very specific feeders. They're filter feeders with their long, long baleen. They collect tiny little bits of zooplankton. So they have to go where there's huge, massive amounts. Because if you start picking out one, two, three zooplankton, and you're not in a very high, high density area of those, you're going to be um, eating for a long time before you gain some weight. So you've got to be where they are, right? Well, things like climate change have affected where the food sources are. And so we are starting to see the animals move in places that they maybe previously weren't before. Also, things like toxins can build up in their body. When we study those things, we learn what's going on in the rest of the environment. So I would say, in every sense of the word, they're foundation species, um, the right whales. Um, they're sentinel species, the right whales. And for those, I would also classify all of the great whales as such, because they're such a large organism that they really take a much bigger role than one might expect. It would be a great loss to be without them. Yes, you have a question? Uh, yeah. I know there are people that study and listen to whale songs, and I think the humpbacks in particular are famous for their songs. Are they making any progress in interpreting those? Some, yes. That's a really good question. I didn't think anyone was going to ask me about um, acoustics tonight. And I'm definitely not an acoustic expert. I would uh, turn that over to some of my um, more well-established colleagues. But what I can say about that is that in the, I'm not sure if it was the late 60s or early 70s, forgive me for not having the exact facts. I can find out for you. But Dr. Roger Payne of Ocean Alliance discovered that whales create songs that are individualized. And every year a new hit comes out. So it's really nice to be able to look from year to year. The soundtracks can definitely change. And some of them can be eight minutes long and repeatable. But they're, they're quite interesting to listen to. And they are studied. And they do seem like they're their own language. Uh, more and more is being learned each and every season because we're amassing a bigger call library, like I was talking about during that passive acoustic monitoring stint. But, um, I can't give you exact detail on it, but what I can say is that each type or species of whale, like the say whale, the finback whale, the humpback whale, um, any of those, they can be identified by species through the sound, and also the sound that is made might be classified differently. 
Like there's one sound that's a gunshot, and there's one sound that's a scream, there's one sound that's an up call, and all of those different classified types of sounds can mean different things. I don't think there's a literal translation on Google yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> Anyone else from the audience have a question? I'll take one more, and then we're going to talk to our online friends over there. What's the effect of climate change, particularly on the right whales? Hmm, that's a good question. And probably, um, if you want to go out to lunch for like 17 hours, I'll tell you all about that. <laughs> um, that's a, it's a really broad topic, and we can certainly delve more into that. But what I can say in particular um, is that food distribution, as I mentioned in a previous question, has been a really serious issue because the temperature of the water affects how much oxygen is in it, and how many nutrients are there. Like we talked about, the whales like to come north to colder climates so that they can eat really good food when it's time to eat. Um, and so the climate change that has occurred changes the temperature of the ocean. That also changes currents. And so the food can shift where it is. And so the animals that eat that food have to figure out where their food is and then move to it. And if they don't move to it, what happens? If they don't move to it and get good food, they don't survive so easily, right? So you have two choices. You can shift and move, or you can stay where you are and not do so well. We're seeing a little bit of all of that. Um, it gets much more complicated than that, but certainly it's being affected, and um, their migration patterns can change, which is why we should continue to survey and find out what kind of patterns we're seeing. Good question. Can we get some questions from our online audience and see what they have to say? One question we have from the online audience how much, how well the ethnic liberation schemes have been combined with? Oh, like, do people actually pay attention to them? Exactly. Okay, so if you, guys, if you guys didn't hear that, the question, I'll just paraphrase it, was how well are the traffic separation schemes working with people? As in, are we actually paying attention to them? So I know they're there. You now know they're there. And let's hope that anybody who knows how to read a map knows that they're there, right? Well, every time a new traffic separation scheme comes out, they are printed on new maps. And then they're, I guess I'll say, shouted out to anybody who's a mariner so that they know. So that's one way to get the word out. Um, there are notices that go to mariners. The other way is that those laws are enforced. Ships that have an AIS system attached to them can be monitored where their location is. And if they're not in their location, they'll be notified by the Coast Guard or some other organization who uh, will enforce that law. Um, there is a little bit of leverage with that. If there's a dangerous issue that, and a reason why they can't be right in the shipping lane, they can certainly take a different route if they need to. But in general, yes, I will say that the schemes have worked very well. Shipping lane shift is a very easy way to reduce any problems, and it doesn't really take much longer to get to your destination. So, good question. Any others? Another question we have is how much the cow tags that you talked about can hurt the whales. So the, those cow tags I'm talking about aren't really used on the larger species, but I have seen them used with some of the smaller species, like porpoise and dolphin, only just to tag the number and location where they came from. Usually where they're placed is on the dorsal fin in the, the back of the animal. In the thinnest part, where it's all cartilage, it's a little bit like mm, piercing your ear, right? Um, and yes, I imagine that could hurt a little bit, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's one way to be able to track an animal and know where it is if it ever comes up, washes up on the beach again. Um, but oftentimes, the way that those are screwed in, uh, they rust away after a short time, and they fall off, and things heal over. You may have a scar from it. I would definitely say it's more invasive than the suction cup, but it is one method. If an animal has a choice between life with a tag for a while and death without one, I'll definitely go with the tag. Any other questions from our online audience? Do they do blood tests on whales? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the question is, do they, I assume they, researchers, do blood tests on whales? I hope you don't go out and do blood tests on whales because you're going to need a needle like the size of Texas. And also, they're a little bit dangerous to be moving around. Um, yes, you can definitely do that. Uh, in the past, I have collected data on whales with a handheld 
blood analysis machine called an abaxis machine where you can take a drop of blood just like if you have diabetes and you're testing your blood glucose you can put a drop in there and get a whole suite of uh, chemical analysis so it's a great thing to do as an indicator to know what's going on with an animal like a dolphin or a porpoise that washes ashore maybe they're sick um, it's something that really helps us to assess the health of the animal it's also done in the larger species but as I've never climbed on top of a whale or worked with someone who does the larger species work. I can't really give any information about that, but sounds like it'd be a really cool job. <laughs> any other questions from our online audience? Finally, we have a question. Of all the humpbacks that you have seen in your career, do you have any favorites and why? Yes, I do have favorites. Um, I love calves. That's the, the younger juvenile I'll say the baby whales. I'm not supposed to say that, but the baby whales. I love them. Love them so much because they're so tiny. You know, like they're only the size of a minivan or something like that. So they're wicked, <laughs> wicked cute. Um, individuals, I would say Ventisca, the blizzard that we saw earlier. Remember, we had that slide with the dive sequence, the one with all the big white speckles. She's an amazing mom. Um, I'll give a really quick story. Uh, when I was five years old, I went out on the Captain John boats in Plymouth. And they're, they're still working uh, in very successful business today. Um, and I saw my first whale ever. Her name was Owl, a female, older, older humpback whale. And she was named Owl because there's one big dot on either side of her tail. And so it kind of gives her the appearance of owl eyes. Well, since then, she's been through so much. She's, been, she's had babies. She has migrated multiple times again and again. She's also been hit by vessels and has some serious scars. So she is a story of survival to me. And whenever I'm writing a thesis or reading a scientific paper or going to a conference, I always think of Owl because no matter all the threats she's ever had to deal with, all the problems, she still survived and she's still making it happen. So she's my favorite. <laughs> so from this point, I'm going to wrap up the questions from the audience. And I'm going to give you the final message. Before I do, can I have you take one second to just appreciate this gorgeous photo from Sea Salt Charters? Do you know what you're looking at here? Feeding. It is feeding, feeding behavior. This is open mouth feeding behavior from humpback whales last August in Stellwagen Bank. It's pretty cool, huh? You can see the, the palette of the mouth, the pink strip there, and the baleen hanging down, and that expandable throat like a bullfrog just filled with water like a swimming pool. There's two whales there. I just think it's an incredible photograph, and I wanted to point it out. So I want to give you a final message. We went over a lot of details today, and there's so many more things to learn and so much that I can't tell you about. But one thing that I'm sure that you understand from my presentation tonight is that uh, whales are magnificent and fascinating and totally awesome. And um, I don't really care if you don't like them, because saving them means that you're also saving the world, because they're a big part of the puzzle. So think about that. Next time you go to roll down your window and maybe some trash falls out of it, or if you want to take your bike instead of your car half a mile away, or if you go on a whale watch that's whale sense certified, or something like that, you know? If you want to be paying attention to slowing down in an area where right whales have been seen recently, all these conscious choices that you make are making waves and it's really important that we stick to those to understand them and to keep fighting because although sometimes it seems bleak for an animal like the humpback whale or like the right whale that there's only 500 left, there's things that we can do and every person is adding to making it better. So that's about all I have for tonight. I want to tell you to tune in next month because we're going to have another presentation. I promise you won't get a whale overload because this one's going to be about birds. It's on the wing Friday, February 20th at 7 o'clock once again. There'll be more information about that. I want to give a special shout out to the Goldenrod Foundation who produced this event tonight. Um, I really love working with them, along with my other uh, special friends <laughs> that I've uh, given thanks to here tonight. Uh, a lot of these pictures were not taken by me, and I want you to make sure if you ever go through this that you check out the photo credit and visit those wonderful websites and appreciate the research that has been going on for so long with them. So that's all I have to say. My name's Lindsay Hurt. I'm a very, very happy marine biologist, proud native of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>